immunity refers to the ability of the body to recognize and to combat infections. And an infection relates to the presence of microorganisms in the body tissues. So for example, there could be a bacterial infection or there could be a viral infection. They're both caused by the presence of these replicating entities in the body tissues that shouldn't be there. And the role of the immune system is to recognize these non-self organisms and to eliminate them from the body tissues so that the body tissues once again can be sterilized because the body tissues are supposed to be sterile, free from any infection whatsoever. Well, we live in an unseen environment of microbiology with microorganisms absolutely everywhere on the surface of the earth, below the earth, and indeed quite a long way above the earth. We live in this ecosystem. And because there's all these microorganisms, all this microbiology about, this means that there's a possibility that we can get infected. Now, the idea here is that human tissues are supposed to be sterile under the skin, under the outer layers of the skin, it's supposed to be sterile. And if there's microbiology growing, microorganisms growing in human tissues, we call that infection. And that gives rise to the entire spectrum of infection and infectious diseases. And because of this possibility of infection, we need immunity. We need to be immune to this. We need active and passive immune responses. And because this is so involved in disease and infection, as healthcare providers, we need to know about it. And the more we know and understand, the more effective clinically we can be, the more we can help poorly people and the more we can help healthy people to stop becoming poorly people, that we can keep healthy people to remain healthy. And I feel that we can understand this better, we can get a more conceptual understanding if we know a little bit about the context and the development of the ideas. So in this talk, we're going to talk about principles of microbiology and infection, but we're going to do it from a historical perspective, how we came to know what we now know. What we can see here is a normal sewing needle, as you might use to sew on some of your buttons. And the picture on the left is a scanning electron micrograph. So it's using electrons to generate the picture, but it's a scanning electron micrograph as opposed to a penetrating electron micrograph. And the picture on the right hand side is exactly the same needle, just with greater magnification. And when we look at the needle on the right hand side, we can start to see the imperfections in the surface of the steel. So two ordinary sewing needles at increasing magnification. Let's look at the next slide. This scanning electron micrograph is a continuation of the previous sequence. And we're actually looking at the same needle that you might use for sewing. So that big flat bit on top is actually the very point of the needle. And the point of these series of micrographs is you can start to see some small encapsulated sausage shaped structures now on the surface of this needle. And let's look at the next slide to see what these are. Now this is the same sequence of photographs and these are just at larger magnification. And now we can clearly see that these are individualized cellular units. And what these are, are individual bacterial cells on the surface of this sewing needle. So this gives us an idea of the scale of these bacterial organisms. This quite amazing scanning electron micrograph shows a group of bacilli. These are individual bacterial cells. And we know they're bacilli because they're sausage shaped. Cocci would be round. So these are bacilli. 
And these are individual prokaryotic bacterial organisms capable of self-replication and generating infection. Infections can also be caused by a virus. And viruses are way smaller than bacteria. And viruses are actually intracellular parasites. So the bacteria will get into the body tissues and infect the spaces between the cells, between the body cells, between the somatic cells of your own tissues. Whereas the viruses will actually get into the cells and infect the inside of the cells. They are obligate intracellular parasites and are much smaller than the bacterial cells that we've seen on the previous slides. This particular one is a rotavirus which can cause gastrointestinal disturbances and infections. Here we see another electron micrograph of an individual virion, an individual viral particle. And this is one of the papilloma type of viruses. Now you might have heard of HPV, human papilloma virus. And human papilloma virus can cause chronic inflammation in a variety of human tissues and can lead to malignant change over time. So for example, cervical carcinoma is nearly always caused by human papilloma viral infection because the papilloma virus gets into the individual cells, it parasitizes the individual cells and over time can lead to malignant change in those cells. The particular data on this slide is taken from parish records, so Botoff without Oldgate, which is an old church, it's still there in London today. But this could have been taken from pretty well anywhere in the Middle Ages or indeed throughout a lot of human history and indeed tragically could still be taken from many poorly developed countries today as we've seen in the recent Ebola outbreak for example. And what the graph is showing is the dotted line, the dotted line are the christenings. So that relates to the birth rate in the parish because in those days everyone would be christened and the solid line with the peaks in it relates to the burials and we can see that the birth rate is fairly constant whereas the death rate is showing peaks so 1563 1593 1603 1625 were all peaks and these peaks were caused by outbreaks of infectious disease such as the black death which would sweep through populations, killing huge number of people, and then it would go away again and death rates would go back to normal. So this threat of infectious outbreaks of disease was always there to threaten life. Now these bodies were found during the recent diggings in London when they were working on the Crossrail project and they were found to relate to the 14th century Black Death. Now, in the middle of the 14th century, the Black Death killed an estimated 75 million to 200 million people throughout Europe. Huge amount of people died. And in 1348 to 1350, there was a really severe epidemic outbreak of the Black Death. There was actually six more smaller outbreaks later on in the 14th century. But in 1348 to 1350, it's estimated that 1.5 million people in England died. And that's out of a total population of 4 million at the time. So really quite devastating. And this was bubonic plague although recent research indicates that there was probably some pneumonic component to it as well. And this compounded with the poor nutrition, meant, poor nutrition meant that people died, usually within three days of contracting the illness. So they could be feeling absolutely fine one day 
then three, four days later, they would die. Now, it's been known for a long time that the disease can be spread by fleas on rats that will then bite people. That's the bubonic plague. But the pneumonic plague, which was probably also involved, is airborne. And that can be spread rapidly through sneezes and coughs. So originally the plague, plague probably arrived in England from uh, black rats on ships, but then spread via rat bites and via simple droplet infection. And by the end of 1349, 60% of the population of London had died from Black Death. It's just unimaginable. Just imagine there was a disease now that killed 60% of the population within a couple of years. This is absolutely devastating. So by the end of 1349, six out of 10 Londoners had died of the Black Death. And we know from DNA analysis that, carried, that was carried out in 2011, that the cause of the Black Death was in fact the bacterium, Yersinia pestis. So it's the Yersinia pestis that caused the death of these victims. A simple bacterial infection, which today we could treat with antibiotics and with quarantine measures. But this shows the importance of public health. We need to be able to quarantine people who have these infectious diseases. And let's just hope that going on into the future, that we'll be able to maintain a stock of antibiotics that will kill bacterium such as Yersinia pestis. These medieval woodcuts are incredibly powerful and graphic because people were living with the constant threat of death at a young age. And I suppose we are in our society to an extent, although thankfully people tend to die when they're older. But in the Middle Ages, outbreaks of bubonic plague would kill the young and kill the old alike. And here we see that death has broken into the storehouse and death is stealing all this guy's money. So this guy's got money on the table. He's got bars on the window to stop people coming in and stealing it. He's got bags of money on his table there by the little table. He's got chests of money on the floor, but it's all worth absolutely nothing because when he dies, he can't take it with him. And that's beautifully illustrated as death comes in and steals all of his money. This other medieval woodcut shows death breaking into a house and running away with the child. But look at the expression on the parent's face. Do they want the child to go? Obviously not, but there's nothing they can do about it. Death is insisting. Look at the child. Does the child want to go with death or is the child desperate to stay with his parents? Clearly the child is reaching out, asking for the parents to help, but the parents can't help. Death is dragging the child out of the house, out of the life of the parents, taking the child with him. And we see the egg timer there on the bottom right of the picture. And the egg timer was often used to illustrate the transient nature of life, that the sands of time were running out. But of course, what you're doing now and the reason that your studies are so important is what you are lear learning to do is you are learning to break into that picture, to take hold of death, to take hold of the child and to separate them. The knowledge that you are requiring is going to help you to separate the grip of death on that child. And that means the child can stay with his parents and grow up and have a normal life. This is the profession that you have chosen to enter. So if you look around, you'll see a lot of examples of this. This one's from a, a church in Norfolk. We see that this couple, John and Phoebe, um, there was a child died on the 5th of October, 1771, aged one year and four months. 
John, the second son, died aged four days. And John, their third son, died aged six weeks. Very high rates of uh, infant mortality. And most of these children, we don't know, but we can expect that they died of infectious diseases. Well, these people are infected with a disease that has been of massive significance in the history of humanity. And it's a viral disease and it's called smallpox. There's two types of viruses that can be involved, variola major and a variola minor. And the death rate with a variola major infection was quite high, perhaps a third of people dying who became infected. And after a few days of being very, very ill, the patients develop small red spots on the skin and that develops into this rash that eventually become fluid filled blisters. And even if the patient survived, particularly with the variola major, 75% of survivors, approximately three quarters of survivors, are left with a scarring of the face and the, the body. There can be possible blindness due to corneal ulceration, possible limb deformities due to uh, arthritis and osteoarthritis, so really a very devastating condition. Now there's evidence of smallpox infection from Egyptian mummies. So this has been a disease which has been in humans for some time. And this terrible picture was taken in Bangladesh in 1973. But the good news about smallpox is that the World Health Organization organized a global vaccination campaign with readily available vaccines. And the last case of smallpox that occurred naturally was in 1977 when this disease was eradicated. But the historical importance of this disease is just immense. In the 20th century, it's estimated that 300 to 500 million people died of smallpox. And in previous centuries, the numbers were even greater than that. Conservative estimates indicate that 300 million people died in South America from smallpox after uh, contact with the Western world after Columbus and Cortez and people like that went to the Americas. Many, many people dying. There used to be huge populations in the Amazon. Similar situation with American, North American uh, indigenous people. Um, huge amounts of death from smallpox and other diseases to which the people had no immunity. But we're talking about hundreds of millions of very, very unpleasant deaths in the history of humanity caused by smallpox. But the good news is that there's been no new cases in the wild since 1977. I guess kind of the bad news is that um, it's rumoured or, or indeed admitted that this virus is still kept alive. In fact, it is definitely uh, it's still kept alive uh, in various centres around the world, uh, in the United States, I think in um, Centre for Disease Control, I think in Port and Down in the UK. And um, I think we can rest assured that the Russians and the Chinese and other countries have also got their own stocks. So why on earth would people want to keep this virus alive? Well, one reason is it could be used in the future for biological warfare. And that means that a, a responsible nation needs to keep a stock of it so they can generate a vaccine against it if there was a microbiological attack. But of course, it's also the possibility to be used for um, biological weapons. On the positive side, studying the genome, for example, of the smallpox virus, a great deal has been learnt about virology. So it's been uh, useful to keep this virus alive, to keep copies of this virus alive rather than eradicating it altogether. But the dangers, of course, go without, uh, go without saying the dangers are self-obvious. Well, I know it's a bit depressing looking around old graveyards, but it can be quite informative. So this family all died at a young age. Even the parents were only in their late 20s, early 30s when they died. Terrible tragedy for the family. Now, we can't say why this family died from this information, but 
we do know at the time the most common cause of death by far was various infectious and communicable diseases. Now I've actually done a very detailed podcast on the history of immunity and immunisation with Edward Jenner in this series so you can consult that if you want. So we're just going to do a quick review here. But Edward Jenner is known as the father of immunology, 1796 and let's look at what happened. So there was a lot of cow maids around where Edward Jenner lived and their job would be to milk the cows. And one of the milkmaids was called Sarah Nelms and this cow was called Blossom. And what happened was that Sarah actually caught a disease which is similar to smallpox called cowpox, much less serious than smallpox. But she caught cowpox, the viral infection she caught from milking the cows. So Edward Jenner made this observation that although these women got cowpox, after that they didn't seem to get smallpox. It was as if having cowpox protected them against smallpox. And this is a drawing of uh, Sarah Nelms' hand and we can see these cowpox pustules, these pussy spots that developed. But why was it, Jenna wondered, that these women were not getting smallpox when the general population was from time to time getting smallpox? So to test this idea, what Jenna did was he took some of the pus from one of the cowpox pustules on Sarah's hands and he rubbed that into the skin of this healthy young boy, James Phipps. So he deliberately exposed James to the cowpox, what we would now know to be the cowpox virus. And then after that, he exposed James to smallpox. Pretty dangerous thing to do, but fortunately Jenna was right. And James did not get the smallpox because he'd previously been exposed to the cowpox. So because James had been exposed to the cowpox, he developed active immunity. His body, his immune system, generated the antibodies to the cowpox virus. But there was cross immunity, fortunately, with the smallpox virus. And then because James had been exposed to the smallpox virus, he would then develop a more specific immunity to the smallpox virus. But this was after he actually had active immunity to the cowpox virus already. So we could say he developed active immunity to the smallpox virus while he was enjoying active immunity to the cowpox virus. Now this great and famous cartoon from the history of medicine shows some of the uh, resistance to Edward Jenner's ideas which were initially around. But as we've said, if you want more details on this, do listen to the podcast on this series that gives you more information about the uh, details and the personalities indeed involved in this famous account from the history of medicine. Now another fascinating character from the history of immunology is John Hunter. Now, John Hunter was primarily a surgeon and anatomist, um, indeed often known as the founder of modern scientific anatomically based um, surgery. And he'd actually taught Edward Jenner. But his contribution is very interesting. So at this time in the 1700s, and indeed for a long time after that, of course, and indeed still today, sexually transmitted diseases were a, a big problem. And at those time, that time, there was two well-known sexually transmitted diseases, the clap and the pox. Now, we would now know the clap as gonorrhea and the pox as syphilis. So we thought that the clap and the pox were caused by a venereal poison. So there was a single venereal transmitted, sexually transmitted poison. That, that was what John Hunter hypothesised. So... He wanted to test this idea. So how to prove that gonorrhea and syphilis, that the clap and the pox are the same disease. So in 1767, he took infected pus from a patient infected with the clap, with gonorrhea. 
And the story goes it was from a local prostitute who was infected with this sexually transmitted disease. So we took infective pus from this uh, lady and he inoculated himself with it. So he infected his own urethra and his own penis with this infected pus in the great tradition of self-experimenters. And signs and symptoms of gonorrhea quickly appeared. But unfortunately, he later developed clinical features of syphilis as well. And in John Hunter's mind at the time, this confirmed that they were manifestations of the same disease. Now, we, of course, now know that they're different diseases, just with different incubation periods. But from the empirical evidence he had available, this single type of pus, and this is, of course, before virology and microbiology and bacteriology were understood, this single type of venereal pus caused the features of gonorrhea and the features of syphilis, indicating that they were different stages in the same disease. He was wrong, but you can see where he got the idea from. Now, John Hunter treated himself with local cautery, that is uh, burning to the uh, lesions on the genital areas, and uh, chemical burning and uh, systemic mercury. So pretty unpleasant uh, treatments. And actually, it's not entirely clear why John Hunter died, but um, he may have developed uh, some aortic stenosis, which can be a complication of syphilis, which may have contributed towards his death some years later. And then it, from uh, then until Alexander Fleming, all students knew that a night with Venus could mean a year with Mercury because Mercury for a couple of centuries was the treatment of choice for syphilis and uh, yeah, for syphilis. Well, of course, Edward Jenner and uh, John Hunter didn't know the agents that were causing the disease they were investigating and trying to prevent. In fact, it wasn't until the development of germ theory with people like Louis Pasteur that this became known. For example, um, Louis Pasteur isolated Streptococcus pneumoniae, the, what was sometimes called the pneumococcus the etiological bacteria of most types of pneumonia or many types of pneumonia. That was 1881, 1881 that was discovered. But the title of uh, founder of modern microbiology normally goes to uh, Robert Koch. He was a German physician and uh, he also isolated pure bacterial cultures. Specifically, he found out the cause of uh, anthrax cholera and uh, tuberculosis and in fact he won the Nobel Prize in uh, 1905 for his work on tuberculosis. It's interesting as, as late as the 1890s people thought tuberculosis was an inherited disease. It was uh, Robert Koch that showed that it was an infectious disease not an inherited disease and he worked on guinea pigs um, and he found that TB satisfied all four of his uh, postulates which we'll look at very shortly. So the etiological organism we now know is a microbacterium tuberculosis. Unfortunately, Koch couldn't treat it. Um, but if you know what's causing it and start to learn how it's spread, then hopefully you can prevent it. So what are these things we've just mentioned, Koch's postulates? So Robert Koch determined that tuberculosis was a communicable infectious disease because it fulfilled all four of these postulates and these represent the gold standard of adjudicating whether something is infectious or not so how do we know if a disease is communicable if it's caused by an infectious microbiological agent well it has to fulfill cost postulates so firstly the specific causative organism must be found in every case of the disease if you look enough. So everyone who's suffering from tuberculosis will have the tuberculosis bacteria in them some way. You just have to find it and isolate it. And then the disease organism must be isolated in pure culture. So this is one of the really clever things Robert Koch did. He worked out various nutrient media 
for growing up pure cultures of organism. And of course, this is the basis of the culture and sensitivity testing we use all the time today. So you must be able to isolate the organism in pure culture. Then having isolated that, you need to be able to take some of that pure culture from your agar plate or whatever it is, reintroduce that into a healthy subject and produce the same disease. So you got the bacteria from an individual suffering from the disease. You make a pure culture of that bacteria. You use that pure culture of that bacteria to inoculate someone else and they must develop the same disease. They will develop the same disease because it's the same etiological microorganism. And then the final proof, the clincher, the, uh, the fourth component, is that that disease organism must be recovered from the inoculated subject. So again, you are reproducing the bacteria from the inoculated subject. And that's how we know every disease is communicable or not. That's the gold standard for how we adjudicate whether a disease is communicable. It fulfills Koch's postulates. Interesting story from more recent times. Barry Marshall, the Australian uh, gastroenterologist, he speculated that uh, peptic ulcers were partly caused by Helicobacter pylori, but no one believed him. So he actually drank a large draft of Helicobacter pylori and induced peptic ulceration in himself, thereby fulfilling some of Koch's postulates therefore demonstrating that the disease was, or at least could be, communicable.